That's fine. Just remember that while you're sitting on 200 grand of student loans, I'm out of debt. Damn. Hey guys, Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. And today I am reacting to an episode of Grey's Anatomy. And this is an OG episode, season one, episode four. And in fact, I got recommended this episode by one of you guys. I got a letter very early on in my YouTube journey where somebody asked me to react to this video and I found it when I was cleaning out my office the other day. And I said, you know what? I should absolutely react to this episode. So I hope you guys enjoy and let me know what you think. If there's other episodes or TV shows or movies you want me to react to, please comment and list them down below. And as always, if you like the content you see, make sure you subscribe and share this channel with your friends. You are the first person they see in the morning. You say please, you say thank you, you apologize for waking them up. You make them feel good about you. Why is that important? Because then they'll talk to you and tell you what's wrong. Why is that important? Because then you can tell your attending what they need to know during rounds. And why is that important? Because if you make your resident look bad, she'll torture you until you beg for your mama. I think Bailey is the chief resident in this episode and she's talking to all the interns about how to act during morning rounds. And so when you're a surgical resident, you round very early in the morning. It's like five in the morning. So you're waking up the patients super early. They're not in the chattiest mood, but that's the only time you have to see them because then right after that, you have to run to the operating room to go operate all day. I apologize to all of you who've had surgery if I ever woke you up or if another surgical resident woke you up, but that's the time that we have to wake you up. You always come in like that, bang the light on. No, <laughs> I've never had a patient what ask me that. What does my chart say? It says you used to be a nurse here. A scrub nurse. And that you have abdominal mass consistent with pancreatic cancer. Oh, and you are hoping they're gonna give me a Whipple. A Whipple is a surgery for pancreatic no, cancer. This hospital sees those one, maybe once every six months. That's why you got here at 4.30, huh? Four. Hmm. Grab my chart for anybody else could see it. This is not really what surgical life is like. You don't just go pick a chart and round on a patient. Usually there's a very systematic order to things so that you have teams that work on different attendings rotations. So this attending Dr. Burke would have a group of residents that round on his patients and then there'd be a junior resident like an intern there'd be a senior resident and there would be the attending maybe more than that depending on how many patients that attending operates on and typically for a case like a whipple which is a major operation would probably be scrubbed in by the senior resident and not the intern maybe the intern would get to scrub in but they wouldn't get to do a whole lot he's having a prostate biopsy trust me if you'd been in there you'd know Okay, Mr. Humphrey, we're gonna get started. Okay, first of all, he is up in stirrups, which yes, you can do a prostate biopsy with a guy up in stirrups, but most often it's done in the clinic and it's done with a man lying on his side with his knees up to his chest and it is not done in a necessarily operating room like they're showing here. So let's talk a little bit about prostate biopsies. Prostate biopsies are done for what's called an elevated prostate specific antigen or PSA. And when you have an elevated PSA, that is a sign that you may have prostate cancer. Nowadays, we're also doing things like prostate MRIs um, and other adjacent tests. However, back when this was filmed, the only thing we typically did was prostate biopsies. And a prostate biopsy essentially is a test where we put an ultrasound in the bottom and we can then see the prostate using the ultrasound, which is right next to the rectum, as I've described many times before. It's a walnut-shaped organ. And using the ultrasound, we can then numb up the prostate with numbing medicine. So that's kind of the most uncomfortable part is passing the probe as well as then numbing the prostate. And then we take at least 12 biopsies of the prostate in different zones of the prostate. Also now, since we are doing MRIs, if we see suspicious lesions, we may take more areas from that particular lesion as well. 
Things you can expect after a prostate biopsy can include some blood in the urine potentially, some blood in your stool, as well as some blood in the semen. The biggest risk after a prostate biopsy is getting an infection. So typically prior to a biopsy, you'll get some antibiotics. You may also do an enema prior to getting a biopsy, and that's completely standard of care, all to prevent a infection after a prostate biopsy. Bethany Whisper. What? Bethany Whisper. I did a new Bethany Whisper lingerie ad. He saw it in a magazine. You got time to pose for magazine? No, the shoot was last year. It just came out. So because he saw you in a thong. No, it wasn't a And thong. you hiding out in the hallway. I just think it might be easier if you sign another interview. Easy is not in your job description. You are a doctor. He is a patient. He's your patient. Biopsy these. If they come back positive, I expect to see you in surgery. Hey, you on this, you understand me? So this is a super awkward situation. I mean, the patient clearly isn't comfortable with her on his case. And so the appropriate thing to do would be to switch the interns on the case. The patient's choice is a priority. Also, she just said biopsy these. And actually, she's not biopsying them. She would have send these to a pathologist who would then look at them under a microscope to see if there was any evidence of cancer. Also, this patient looks rather young. And while we do have young men getting Getting diagnosed with prostate cancer, the average age for diagnosis of prostate cancer is 66. The American Urological Association guidelines for people who should be screened for prostate cancer without symptoms, so this guy may have had symptoms we don't know, starts at the age of 55 to the ages of 69. And typically it's recommended to have a blood test screening with a PSA every two years. However, if you're between the ages of 40 and 54, it depends on your personal history. So if you have a family history of prostate cancer, breast cancer, especially if they have certain mutations called BRCA1 or BRCA2, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, all of those cancers, if they're in your family, you should be screened for prostate cancer earlier. Also, African-American men are recommended to be screened earlier. And for guys over the age of 70, it depends on your overall state of health. If your life expectancy, meaning you're probably going to live longer than 10 or 15 years, then we do recommend to continue screening. However, if you have lots of other health problems, it's recommended to avoid prostate cancer screening because even if you had a low-grade prostate cancer at that point, that it would be very unlikely you were going to die from it because it can be very slow growing. The news is it hasn't spread from his prostate to his lymph nodes. With a radical prostatectomy, we could probably get it all. Good prognosis. Spare some nerves, give him a chance at a normal sex life? Young puppies like to take chances with cancer. Old dogs like me, we do what works. Yes, sir, of course. We on the schedule tomorrow? Yeah, uh, 10 a.m. Good. Maybe I can squeeze in around. <laughs> An ass who deals in asses. Oof. That does not make urologists look good. So what they're talking about here is doing a radical prostatectomy, which is a treatment for localized prostate cancer. So she's saying it hasn't spread to the lymph nodes. You wouldn't know that from a biopsy. Presumably he's had a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis to ensure there's no spread, at least visible on the lymph nodes. She asked him about sparing the nerve. So you can have what's called a nerve sparing prostatectomy and a non-nerve sparing prostatectomy. When you look at the prostate, there are nerves that go on the side of the prostate and these contribute to erectile function. So depending on how aggressive the cancer is, most often urologists will offer a nerve sparing prostatectomy if possible. That's so that men can ideally maintain erectile function after a prostatectomy. The two major long-term potential complications of prostate cancer surgery are having urinary incontinence, so leakage when you cough, sneeze, or lift heavy things, or do exercise, and erectile dysfunction. And so these things usually, when you're having a nerve-sparing prostatectomy, and with robotic technology these days, the risks of these are rather low. So typically, with urinary incontinence, most people will have some urinary leakage after the surgery initially, but over that first year of recovery, it will 
continue to improve and up to 85% of people will have full continence after surgery and not have any leakage. As far as erectile function, it depends on one, how your erectile function was before the surgery, and two, if you're getting a nerve sparing prostatectomy, the prognosis is very good of regaining your erectile function after recovery from surgery. Urologists are not going for tea time in the morning before they start surgery. Typically, we start surgery at 7.15, 7, 7 a.m., and we operate all day. So I'm not sure what this urologist is talking about or what age he's from, but certainly that's not how we operate today. George, stop. <laughs> Dude, that is so messed up. We have Bethany Whisper in our locker room. Oh boy, I guess they do uh, airbrush out the tattoo, don't they? You wanna see it? You really wanna see it? Fine. Let's oh look my at that god. Up close and personal, shall we? And what are these? Oh my god, breasts! How does anybody practice medicine holding these things around? And what do we got back here? Let's see if I remember my anatomy. Glutes, right? Let's study them. Shall we gather around and check out the booty that put Izzy Stevens through med school? Have you had enough or should I continue? Because I have a few more very interesting tattoos. Damn. Medical school is really expensive, and many, many people who come to medical school have had jobs before they went to medical school. They did another career, they took time off. Essentially, how medical school is set up, in most cases, is the first two years is kind of book studying. So you do have anatomy lab in the first year where you actually dissect a cadaver and learn all the anatomy of the human body. And then the rest of the two years is pretty much learning from a textbook and lectures. Now, some medical schools are having clinical time in the first two years. However, it's not consistent throughout the entire nation, at least. And then your third and fourth years are clinical. And so during that time, you'll rotate through all the different parts of the hospital with different services like internal medicine, psychiatry, surgery, and then you'll have time for electives. So you'll do electives with whatever services you might be interested in. So for example, urology in some medical schools is mandatory, but in most medical schools, it's not. So you may go your entire four years and never even really learn much about urology except for a short lecture in your first or second year. I'm sure you're a very good doctor. Then what is your problem? Look, I fantasized about you about the woman in this photo, whoever she is. I'm not proud of it, but it's a fact. There's nothing wrong with that. Do you know what they're gonna do to me today? I have cancer. And they're gonna lift up my legs and expose me to the world and cut out my prostate and my nerves. It effectively neuter me. So is it so hard to understand that I don't want the woman who's in that photo to witness my emasculation? I will say having a prostatectomy and having surgery on your genitals or your prostate is a very intimate moment and it's very scary. And this is really hard for anyone to talk about. And so I think that it's especially for men who tend to not really express themselves quite as well about what they're feeling. And it's totally reasonable for him to be scared and nervous and also be concerned about who's around and watching him. And so it's totally reasonable for him to express that and say, you know, I really don't feel comfortable. And we have to honor the patient's wishes. Like I mentioned before, I want you to feel reassured that if you find a urologist and you are in the unfortunate situation of having to have a prostatectomy for prostate cancer, that we understand how intimate and how important this decision is and how big of a deal it is, and that we will treat you with as much respect and honor as we possibly can. Where are they? He's uh, resecting the prostate, coming up on the distal nerve. Why is she in the operating room without a mask on? 
Dr. Victor, I'm sorry, but these are viable nerves. We should save them. It'll take at least... Wait, he's using a cystoscope? So that is not how you do a prostatectomy. That's how you do a transurethral resection of the prostate, which is done for a benign enlarged prostate. And if you wanna learn more about that, I made a whole video about that. But I'm not, you couldn't even see the nerves through the cystoscope, and it looks like he's just resecting it. At least an hour longer, and we might not get it all. I know they call him Limp Harry. But his prognosis with chemo is nearly as good. And frankly, if you're worried about missing... Look at so many people are not wearing masks. Dr. Stevens? Can we help you? I'm sorry, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Victor, Yeah, he's definitely resecting it with a resectoscope. You have to save the nerves. What? The nerves. You have to save Dr. them. Dr. Stevens, I can handle this. No, you this. told me the most important thing is giving the patient what they want. What Humphrey wants is his erection. She's yours. You get her out. Can't do that, sir. You know how these young puppies are. No one is wearing a mask in the operating room. And I know now with COVID, everyone's wearing a mask outside, but typically the operating room is a sterile area. So everyone should be wearing masks. The anesthesiologist, any surgeon in the room, whether they're operating or not, the nurses, everyone needs a mask on. And usually eye protection as well. This is a urologic surgeon. So he would have his own urology residents operating with him, not a general surgery chief resident and a general surgery intern. And while again, they're not even showing the right operation, they're showing something completely different and wrong. Gosh, this is why medical drama TV is so difficult to watch sometimes. Okay, that's a wrap. I hope you learned something about prostate cancer surgery and PSA screening and how inaccurate these TV shows are. And I hope you had some fun. And if you liked it, make sure you let me know and give me a thumbs up. As always, I'm gonna take care of yourself because you're worth it.